today's topic is the secret of reversing lifestyle diseases. Lifestyle diseases. There's no secret. If you change your lifestyle, right? But how to change and why to change, this is what we're going to talk about. And I do want to say a word about Sharan. It's the organization that I founded in 2015. And Sharan stands for Sanctuary for Health and Reconnection to Animals in Nature. Why reconnection to animals and nature? Because, you know, today in Calcutta, and Calcutta is a beautiful city, but because so many gardens and everything, why reconnection to animals and nature? It's because we're disconnected living in a city. We have no idea how we were actually meant to live. And if we can reconnect to that, health, health is the only possibility. And, you know, to what extent health is the only possibility, I just want to let you know that we conduct a 21-day health retreat, 21 days. Lab tests in the beginning, lab tests in the end, results in 21 days. So, our, and that's not because of us. It's because our bodies know how to heal if we get out of the way. So, as I was saying, today we live in a culture of disease and we have all kinds of diseases. And these diseases, not only are they bad because they have their own uh, complications and all of that, and people are on medications their entire lives for these diseases, but then COVID comes along, and you know, these are all comorbidities as well. But the good news is that these are lifestyle diseases, and that means we are the authors of our health. And that also means that we can reverse all these diseases. Because the body knows how to heal. If we only eat and live the way we were designed to, by nature or God. It's that simple. That means every single thing that I'll be saying today is something that you already know, but you may not be connected with it. We just have to make that connection. Now, reversing disease requires a shift in consciousness because we're living in a culture of disease. And we have to shift to a culture of health. And most people don't like to change cultures. The basic teaching is that you can't improve on nature. If we understand what nature desired, it's done. Human body is so beautiful that we have all these systems that are working in close connection together without us even being aware. Respiratory system, musculoskeletal system, digestive system, reproductive system, circulatory system, everything, endocrine system, everything is working together and we are unaware. And we only complain when we're sick. Instead of saying thank you, thank you every day because it's working so magically that we took it for granted. And, you know, this is a hard one to take, but truly we know that medicines never cure, especially lifestyle diseases. Because someone gets diabetes and they take medicines, and over a period of time, the medicines only spiral upwards, they don't come down. Whether it's heart disease or diabetes or hypertension or any of those diseases I wrote down, it's always the same. But the body always works to heal. And how do we know that the body works to heal? If you get a fracture, the only thing the doctor can do is put the bones together. It's the body that heals. In fact, all too often, we're coming in the way of healing with, with medicines. And we're unaware of that. So I used to live in Bombay, which is also a concrete jungle. And I moved to Oroville, which is much more in nature. And I've been living there for the last 22 years. And I just observed nature. 
I observed animals around me. I have a little house on the beach with lots of nature around and I just watch. And I realized that animals in nature know how to be well. How can it be that we don't? So what should we do to get rid of any disease or to prevent it? Basically, we have to get rid of the cause. Now here you see a diagram of someone who got a foot injury because he stepped on glass. Obviously, his body has to be healthy, but the first thing we need to do is take away the glass, right? So whenever we have any problem, we have to think, what is the cause? For example, if someone has diabetes, they go to the doctor. Doctor says, don't eat sugar, don't eat carbohydrates. Have you heard that? Some of the diabetics don't have fruits, they don't have mangoes for years on end, and they never get well. You know why? Because sugar is not the cause of diabetes. High blood sugar is the result of diabetes. The cause of diabetes is insulin resistance. And if we want to get rid of diabetes, we have to look at what is the cause of insulin resistance, and if we remove it, diabetes is gone. Sometimes in 21 days gone. I just came back from 21-day program, which was in June. And one man came from Portland, USA, and he was on at least 24 medicines, maybe more. And they just tumbled down like a pack of cards, and he went out only on a very minimal amount of insulin. He wasn't on medicine only for diabetes, but he was just shocked at the rate at which his medicines were going away. And that was just because he got well. And he lost more than six kilos in 21 days, and not by dieting. We have buffets, not like yours, not that much, but we have buffets for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and nobody counts how much you can eat. You're supposed to eat according to your hunger. No starving, six kilos down, 21 days. So what I'm trying to say by this is not anything except that our body knows how to heal, and we just need to tap into it. So here you see that there's causes, which are the root causes, and then there are the symptoms of the problem. When we take medicines, we only treat the symptoms, and that's why we never get well. But if we keep thinking, what is the cause? Only health, nothing else. So today we're going to talk about physical health, but we can also talk, depending on the time we have, about mental health. How can you get rid of depression, anxiety, mental stress? Because, you know, stress also causes disease, right? And even beyond health, depending on what we can do. But let's first take physical health. And what is the logic of nutrition as medicine? We have been brought up thinking that we are omnivores. We have been told that we are omnivores. Who would salivate if a chicken walked by? Maybe a dog or a fox. Chicken is dog food, and we're eating it left, right, and center. Now, when we do this, it's like taking a car that runs on petrol and putting in diesel. After a while, you're going to have problems, right? And that's exactly what's happening over here. But if you see a dish like this, does your mouth water? And maybe, yes. And why does your mouth water, you know? Because of conditioning. Because we have been taught to have it because it's our culture. So we eat these things. Imagine if you see green fields of wheat or rice. Does your mouth water? No, but wheat and rice are front and center in our diet these days. Why our mouth doesn't water? Because we can't eat these raw. 
and all the animals on the planet eat their food raw. But we can't eat these. So it's not our food. But we're eating it, so it's like putting diesel in a car that runs on petrol. Now, whose mouth would water if you, they saw fields of wheat and rice? Cows. So now we're eating dog food, cow food. I mean, no wonder we are sick, right? So the best food for us is the food that instinctively we are attracted to. Now, even if you look way beyond, and I don't have time to talk about everything today, but just to give you hints, if you look at the teeth of a carnivore, and then you look at the teeth of a herbivore, and then you look at the teeth of true omnivores, and now you look at our own teeth, we are not there. So, we have made that mistake that has got repeated in our culture and now we're sick. And many vegetarians here and vegetarians and non-vegetarians get the same diseases, don't they? Diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, cancer, whatever, everything is the same. And that's because milk and meat have the same properties. High protein, high fat, and no fiber, right? But milk is the food that every baby has from its mother, and every baby has only when it's young. If you see all the animals, no animal drinks another animal's milk. That means pigs don't drink goat's milk, monkeys don't drink elephant's milk. We are the only species that drinks another animal's milk. And if you look at the baby, baby loves its mother's milk, doesn't want to leave mother's milk. But when you first give cow's milk, does any baby appreciate? So we know the answers, as I told you, but we are doing something different because of our culture. And we are being manipulated by advertisement. You know, when you see advertisements, you feel like having those things. And I always say that advertisements cost a lot. Have you seen that advertisements cost a lot? Nobody will advertise something which is in our instincts. So it's very simple to know what to eat and what not to eat. If it's advertised, don't eat that. Simple. Right? Have you seen that milk, eggs, chicken, everything is advertised? But have you seen advertisements for apples and oranges, carrots and cucumbers? Never happens, right? So the food that's most suitable to us, we already know, we just have to go for it. And I can tell what you're thinking right now. It's a feeling of deprivation. Like, how am I going to do without my rice and my fish or my veg... Uh, what, um, Wheat, chapatis, or whatever, right? Milk, oh God. What will I do for tea and what will I do for curds and all that? And of course, Cal Calcutta is known for its milk sweets. So, that's why we ha have a menu there, which, fingers crossed, is going to be completely plant-based. So that you can see that there are a lot of things that you can eat. The other thing is that ideally it should be whole food. You know, when we refine foods, we don't get much nutrients out of them. Like oil has no nutrients, sugar has no nutrients, white rice has no nutrients, white flour has no nutrients. Maximum nutrients of anything is just under the skin. So even if we peel all our vegetables, we're losing too many nutrients. And nutrients are the spare parts for healing. So I always say, eat like a monkey. That means, eat the foods which a monkey would eat in the way that it would eat. Like, if a monkey were to eat a watermelon, it would eat like this. And it means, peel your bananas, but don't peel your apples. Right? And the last important thing is that we are the only species that sprays our food with poison so that other animals don't eat it. And then we eat it. 
And that's why organic is so very important. If we can eat only organic food, we are not putting poison in our body every single day. And high quality spare parts are better than any medicine because we need high quality nutrients to heal. So once we've got all this going, body heals. That's all, nothing more. And you know, when we are working with diabetics at the 21 day, there's no restriction on fruit because sugar is anyway not the cause of diabetes. And if you were to go to a farm or an orchard and you see fruits and vegetables, what will you pick first? Fruits. So ideally, we should have fruits every single day and some of us don't have fruits at all. And we are instinctively attracted to colors and manufacturers know this. So sometimes when you see all this, you feel like taking one of each and that's the problem. So, in summary, what I recommend is only plant-based foods, only whole foods and organic as far as possible. And two important supplements should be checked if they are low, vitamin D and vitamin B12. And if they are low, they need to be supplemented. And that's it. That's basically all the important things that I have to say about why and how for physical health. Nandita ji. Thank you very much for a basic talk, you know, you, you talk to our hearts, I think. All of us, you know, kind of related to everything that you said. So just to begin, uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, you know, is beginning young uh, an option? Sure. You know, you can, I mean, we should be eating the right diet at any age and children know this. You know, I've had parents come to me and say, my child doesn't eat anything. But child is running around full speed, looking totally healthy. I say, what is your child eating? Oh, he eats only raw fruits and vegetables. As if raw fruits and vegetables is nothing. So, we have the information wrong. We are doing wrong things. And then, but we can easily start. Children do not need any milk after mother stops giving milk because that's what God or nature designed. And anyway, we in India, we have too much milk. But if you think about it, all of Southeast Asia never consumed milk. There's no milk in Chinese food, Japanese food, Thai food, Malaysian food, even Sri Lankan food, Burmese food. They don't have milk. So, it's not that you can't grow up without milk, you know? Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I guess. So, uh, what are the proactive measures that we need to take to, you know, get used to nature or natural food or plant-based food? I think, you know, whenever we are doing something new, we have to learn a few things and then put it into practice. And it, it's not like we have to do everything overnight because change is difficult for everyone. What we need to do is understand what we should do, do as much as we can, don't do nothing because you can't do everything, and then the next step just comes by itself. For example, when we do our 21-day retreat, it's not without wheat and rice. All the food is organic and all the food is plant-based, but it's not zero grain. And we still get results. And when I, I've seen people who came to our 21-day retreat who said that I don't want to eat grain anymore. And they stopped on their own. But it's a choice because grains are similar to I mean, they are plants, so they're slightly closer to the food that we should eat. And so we don't get so much problems from them. And having said that, there are so many people who have glucose intol I mean, gluten intolerance and dairy intolerance. You know, uh, lactose intolerance. And that's just because these are anyway not our foods. 
right? Yeah. So COVID has brought us to a screeching halt when immunity comes to the picture. We have thousands of questions on immunity. So having high immunity or boosting immunity, does it help in preventing diseases, lifestyle diseases? So there are two important things with COVID. One is that if you have lifestyle diseases, there are comorbidities for COVID. And honestly, anyway, it's a comorbidity because if you have lifestyle diseases, you never know what's going to happen. Anyway, we should improve our immunity because today we have COVID, now there's monkeypox, swine flu, and bird flu, and everything's going on. And if our population increases, then automatically that spreading is more, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's our duty if we don't want to be sick to improve our immunity. Yeah. So there, is there a plant-based generic high immunity diet that everyone can follow or a few things that everyone should follow? Luckily, no. Because that means that you have a huge variety and you can pick and choose just as you like. For example, if you go to our website, you will see 600 recipes there. Right? And if you see the recipe book outside, then there's 70 plus recipes just in that book. So I have to say that you won't be eating something very different from what you're used to. Because almost anything can be made without, without using the standard ingredients. Like, for example, we make ice cream, we make pizzas with cheese, but we use plant-based cheese. And we make uh, all kinds of desserts and even rasgulla. And I mean, we just have a healthy version of everything. Right. Which brings me to the question of diets. How do I know what diet is good for me and my body? True. And so that's a question that anyone can ask. Because someone goes to naturopathy and they get a diet and somebody goes follows ketogenic diet and so there are different kinds of diets and here I want to say that this is not a diet you know because this is what we were meant to have by nature or God how can you possibly go wrong right so we have only two rules eat when hungry drink when thirsty Nothing more. It's that simple. And that's the rules that we were born with. Like a baby cries when it's hungry. Right? So, so it, that makes me think, are diets actually habitual? Can we reorganize our lives around these kind of food habits anytime, at any age? So I think you can. But remember that when you go back into society, they are pulling you back to the usual culture of disease. And therefore, for those people who don't have the willpower or feel they can't do it or whatever, for them we have programs like the 21-day retreat because it takes 21 days to change a habit. But the common uh, piff which comes out of this is, uh, once I do the program and get back home, it's a, you know, a large family or a joint family. Right. And we have different age groups of children and grandparents and all coming from the same kitchen. So how do we kind of maintain, maintain. a balance and get uh, right. to this? And so, you know, I want to tell you a story. I was in Ireland and I did a seminar. And this person came to my seminar because she had been pushed by her sister, who was also a homeopath in Germany. So she had pushed her sister into my seminar. And at the end of the seminar, that lady told me, my husband dropped me here, but he, sit, he was sitting in the pub. It was a whole day seminar. He was sitting in the pub all day. And their regular food was potatoes, meat, and alcohol. Beer, maybe. I don't know. Alcohol. And both of them were huge, like overweight, and both of them had heart disease. And so she said, I would like to do it, but how can I do it? My husband wants to eat that food. So I said, look, now it's a question of life and death. If he jumps into the well, do you want to do that? 
So she looked at me, wasn't really sure, but she went home. And on the way, they had a long drive, and on the way, they stopped at a restaurant, and she ordered lasagna. And she saw the fat ooze out of the lasagna, and she looked at her husband and said, do you mind if I try this for three months? And I had already told her that, you know, you just say to your spouse or any family member, will you support me if I try this for three months? What will they say if you say that to them? They say, sure. As long as I don't have to do it, you can do whatever you want. How do they care what you eat, right? So, and especially all of you are ladies. So, as long as they are getting what they want, you can eat whatever you want, right? So, she went home and started cooking one dish for her husband and one dish for her and her husband because obviously he could eat some vegetables as well. And this went on for some time and her heart disease got better, her blood pressure got better, everything got better. And then one day he came and said, would you make for me mince and cabbage? I love your mince and cabbage. And she said yes and she went to the butcher's shop but she couldn't take it anymore. So she came home and made soy mince and cabbage. And then she put it into two pots and said, this is yours and this is mine. And then he ate it and he said, mm, I love your mint, uh, mince and cabbage. And then after some time, he said, can I try some of yours? So she said, yeah, sure, please try. And he took a spoon and he said, I knew it. Mine is much better than yours. <laughs> You see, the family doesn't need to know. If you cook delicious food, and that's what we did even at the 21-day program, if we just made delicious food, and we had cooking classes every day, but towards the end of the program, they got into groups and cooked for the whole group. So there were five or six of them cooking a whole meal for the whole group, of course with the help of the chefs and our team members, but that means that they could cook whatever they were used to, whatever they were missing, but it was made with our style and they saw that it was so good because it doesn't need to taste different or doesn't need to taste very different and it might even taste better. So is it in the, in the long run, I was just thinking when, while you were talking, why is it in the long run it's so difficult to maintain these kind of diets? Is it willpower and discipline truly or is it that your body gets aligned to? I think the it's the culture we live in because if you're socializing every day, then um, how do you do it? So that's right? my next question. With right. so much of travel and socializing. So, so I just want to tell you, like me, it's easy because I'm meeting people who think like me, right? But for the others, how do they do it? And um, so initially it is difficult. I had a couple who were from Israel and one of them had severe asthma and allergies and the other one had heart disease and it was severe. So they started, they changed their diet because they wanted to get well. And when they went back, they used to meet their friends every Sunday. So what they did was they invited their friends to their house every Sunday, initially. And after some time, everybody, they said, we have a Sangha in, they have a village in Israel. And they said, the whole village is our Sangha because we are all doing it together and they are also getting better. And they are also inviting now. So it's a matter of starting. You know, family is more difficult than friends. So before I go there, because you all are friends, right? Can I invite some people up on the... Yeah, sure. Okay. So I met Aruna today and I met Rajkumari, but I invite anybody from this audience who has followed this and who got better. Could you come up and just share what changed and how you are. So please come up as soon as possible. Okay, great. So Rajkumari. Yeah, good evening, everyone. In 2008, when she came, I was lucky enough that she stayed over with me. So while eating, she used to always speak about, you know, 
Israel and Germany and people following the vegan diet. And I used to wonder, oh my God, if they can do it, even I can do it. And I was like, you know, that total milk person, vegetarian, but yes. So I said, let's try it. And I went ahead with it. And it's unbelievable. At that time, I can say 14 years back, I had this knee joint which was swelling. I had a lot of gastritis, a lot of issues with my life. In one month, I saw all of them going down 90%, 90%. My knees were like totally fine. Gastritis was fine. My family also tried to follow it. So my husband left milk. But yes, he does have a little, but minimized. And I'm a vegan totally, until date, 14 years. And as she said, wherever I go, everyone helps me out with my vegan diet. Even if I have my workshops, uh, the master, the friends, all will create a vegan dish for me. And it's a done thing. Thank, Thank you, you so Raj Kumari, much. for sharing. And Aruna, would you like to share? For me, it was really surprised when I first heard her in Alka Jalan Foundation online that diabetes can be reversed. So it was like unbelievable. And her one thing really touched me, that was take baby steps. So immediately I stopped oil and ghee and all these using in my vegetables. And believe me, it was same tasty. Her, her recipes are delicious. And the, her smoothies are after the world. And slowly doing that, I lost more than 10 kg in a year. And luckily that was Corona time where we had no parties and no socializing. <laughs> so after that, again, I'm trying to follow her so much. And religiously, I'm not following 50%, but they gave me so good results. Again, I'm now first time I'll go to her retreat and, you know, take the second step forward. So doctor, thank you so much. As I told you, you are a God sent angel, angel in my life. And I'm so much feel better which I lost, I thought I never can be, you know, we always try to reduce weight to, okay, I reduced my insulin from 22 to 11, now I'm on 11 half. My medicines reduced, my BP, everything reduced medicines. Now, I, when I go to retreat, retreat, I think I'll stop all my medicines. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nandita. So, um, thank you, thank you, both Aruna and Raj Kumari, and others didn't come up, but Two, two people is good enough. Yeah, so, so actually listening to these ladies, I felt that, you know, it's more of a healing effect. Food is only a part of it, but I think it's also healing the body and the system and the mind to get used to nature. So why is healing so important to us in today's, you know, day and age in the, in the modern times? You know, some people say that our diet is extreme. Me, I think that disease is extreme, especially heart disease. Imagine getting bypass surgery, cutting open the sternum, getting inside there, stopping the heart for some time. I mean, I think that's Dramatic. extreme. I think medicine is extreme and I have to say that my father is 88 years old and not on a single medicine. My mother died before I knew about this because she died when I was... 25 and she was 50, but my father is following and you know, when it comes to family, family are harder to convince than friends. Friends say, oh wow, you lost weight, even I want to try it. But family says, whatever you say, that is what I won't do. So, isn't it true? But, so I knew that and you know, my two brothers live in the States and my father lives in Mumbai. and. Whenever I used to go and meet them, I would say nothing. But I would be very strict about what I was doing. And eventually, my brothers and their family are also following this. So I'm so lucky because my father's 88 and I don't have to worry that he's sick. Because I know that all my friends my age are looking after their parents these days. 
So is there a correct age or an age to start healing? The sooner the better. Right, so it's a realization of the mind, basically. Okay, so uh, is being vegan mandatory to have a healthy life? I mean, vegan is just a bad word, right? We are herbivores, and vegan and herbivore means the same. So, but our program is not vegan. Our program is plant-based. Plant-based means vegan, yeah. whole, and organic. So you do as much of that as you can. In fact, uh, I was just thinking that brings us to the ancient, you know, science and heritage that we Indians are lucky to have, you know, things like Ayurveda or fermented food or alkaline food, which has been a part of our diets constantly. So would you say uh, implementing them or imbibing them again in our lifestyles are important today? I would say that this is a little far from Ayurveda, for example, because Ayurveda is a system of medicine. What I'm talking about is not medicine, right? And I would say that our ancient culture is perfect. We've just gone too far from that. Because what was our ancient culture? Dal, chawal, roti, sabzi. It's vegan. Right? You know something, the British brought uh, a dairy, um, organized dairy sector to India. Before the British, there was no organized dairy sector. There were no refrigeration. There was nothing. Without refrigeration, how much dairy can you consume? So when I was younger, I used to teach in Europe. And friends my age used to tell me that when we were young, we'd have fish on uh, Fridays and meat on Sundays, and that was it. I know that when I used to go to hotels in, in Europe, there would be something called a continental breakfast, which would be uh, bread rolls and butter and jam and tea and coffee, and that was it. Sometimes some fruit. Now, those same hotels have all kinds of cold cuts, all kinds of sausages, all kinds of yogurts, all kinds of eggs, all kinds of breads, and so on and so forth. That means automatically everyone will get sick if you start the morning so bad. And recently, like not too recently, let's say three, four years ago, I went back to Europe and I was in a hotel um, in Utrecht, and I saw they had lots of vegan options. I was impressed. They had all kinds of salads, a huge salad bar, all kinds of fruits. I mean, things are changing pretty fast. Starbucks has vegan options, and uh, what do you call it? Uh, McDonald's serves vegan options, and if you go to London, Brett has whole vegan and vegetarian bread, the whole shop is vegan and vegetarian. So things are changing. I mean, I was in London pretty recently and, well, before the pandemic, and um, at the airport where I could never find anything to eat for so many years, every single restaurant had labeled vegan options. That's how fast the world is changing. So don't get left behind. So uh, basically, you know, coming back to our ladies' study group, it's a women group. So coming back to women, it's very important for us to understand at what age we should, you know, start healing or start this kind of a life journey. So do you think is there a right time or how do we realize that? See, I'll tell you what, we are all women. And you know, the most common disease today is hormonal problems. What are they? Hypothyroidism, PCOD, infertility. India was a country of over-fertility. Do you have infertility in Calcutta? Yes. See, now left, right and center, right? And then PCOD. And then um, prostate, okay, that's men, but prostate enlargement and breast cancer, and pr prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer, and 
menopausal problems and premature puberty, and I can go on, we have hormonal problems. And all our hormones are orchestrated by the pituitary gland. It's a gland at the back of the brain. And if one hormone goes out of balance, all the hormones go out of balance. And that's why even diabetes is a hormonal problem. Insulin is a hormone. And that's why when we consume meat and dairy, then we are getting the hormones of the animals. Our hormones go out of balance and we are having problems. All this can be set straight and we're setting it straight every day. Yeah, but, uh, you know, on a regular day-to-day -day life, it's very difficult for today's day and age. Women are so busy and strained to understand what to have, actually. Shall I tell you, I've been vegetarian my entire life. And are there other people here who are vegetarian? Anyone put up your hand, lots of them. Okay, so when you travel abroad, can you remain vegetarian? Why? Because mindset is on vegetarian. So you don't even see the chicken on the menu, right? If you just have to change the mindset to our food, that's it. That's all. Minute you have this mindset, job done. I think that's a great lesson. I think it's all in, our, in ourselves, our head. And we just need to open ourselves to the idea. With that, I, I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. I'm sure you're waiting to ask a lot of questions to her. Yes, Rita. Okay, so her question is, what do you think about intermittent fasting and are millets the right substitute for rice and wheat? So intermittent fasting first. Intermittent fasting has a name and sometimes it becomes scary and I would like to know how do you all do intermittent fasting with your heavy social life? But anyway, um, what is intermittent fasting? It means not eating for 16 hours and then eating only for eight hours. And here's the thing, if we were living in nature, then we cannot eat before sunrise because you can't go and pick your food before that and you cannot eat after sunset. Ye to intermittent fasting ho kya, right? So we have to think, is it something that nature or God designed for us? And yes, it is, right? Now, what about millets? Millets are much more nutritious than wheat and rice and so it's a fabulous substitute. But really, when the grains drop off, you don't need millets either. Yes. Okay, so her question is how much seeds and nuts can you include? And look, you know, I told you that the answer is within you. So you just have to access it. So even if I'm gone and the question comes up, you should be able to answer it. So I'm going to answer it for you, right? Nuts. Have you ever seen, and I know that there are a lot of people who've never seen nuts in their shells, but have you all seen walnuts in their shell? And have you seen almonds? Have you seen the fruit of an almond? Have you seen cashews? Maybe pistachios less, but... Okay, so have you seen that if we were living in nature, walnuts would be difficult to open. If you had to open them with a stone, if you, you know, sat under a walnut tree and there are these walnuts all around you. I was in Greece once, I saw all these walnuts. But if you have to open them with a stone, how many walnuts will you eat? Three, four, five, right? So we have to think, what did nature expect us to do? Because right now, we can go to a supermarket and get a big bag and then, you know, nuts are addictive and you don't stop, right? So that's the thing about nuts. Now, seeds are a little different. Seeds we can eat as much as we like. We have sesame, we have pumpkin seeds, we have melon seeds or cucumber seeds or sunflower seeds or... I mean, truly, even wheat and rice are seeds, you know? But we can eat any of the seeds that we can eat raw as much as we like because they're easier to open. 
You know, walnuts are difficult to open. Almonds are much more difficult to open. Cashew nuts are even more difficult to open. Are you following? That means God hasn't made it for us. Therefore, we allow no more than 10 nuts a day. And when we talk about this, we can even talk a bit about honey. If you see a beehive, will your mouth water? That's what I'm saying. All the answers are within you. Okay, y yes. Dr. Shah, thank you so much for that enlightening talk. I have uh, two questions. Since, uh, you know, you've given us an in-depth analysis of nutrition and its effect, uh, and how we can modify uh, this entire concept of nutrition. I'd like to uh, ask you a question about lifestyle medicine, which deals with alteration and treatment of LRD, lifestyle-related diseases. Out of the uh, lifestyle medicine, trying to change one's attitude towards nutrition is actually just one aspect True. Out of a wide variety of True. things, True. like, you know, including psychological support, economical support, True. your home support, depression, anxiety, uh, your lifestyle, your physical activity. So, in your life, how much of lifestyle-related disease is actually just, can be altered with nutrition and how much of it can be altered with something else? See. And my second question before Let I me finish, answer one first right. and then I'll let you ask, answer the second. Are you a doctor or nutritionist? I'm a doctor. Okay, that's great. So, look, if we think about it, and I wasn't able to share everything because <clears throat> time and half an hour and questions and all that, but there are several factors that we have to put in place besides nutrition, exercise, um, so I was saying, rest at the right time, because even sleeping all day and being up all night isn't something good for health, because we have a diurnal rhythm. And it's also our attitude. You know, we need to have an attitude which is, like some people are, and may have a lot of negative attitude, right? So that's not very conducive to healing. So we need to put all these things together. But most things, or sleep at the right time and all that. But most of these things we all know. Um, my second question is, apart from anorexia nervosa and bulimia, which everybody knows of, there is a new disorder called orthorexia. I'm sure you've heard of that because people are becoming more and more obsessive about food, the type of food. And doctors who have treated patients suffering from orthorexia, they have realized that most of these patients who are orthorexic, completely obsessive about food and its effects and what we can do to manipulate it, they are mainly vegetarian mm -hmm. or they are mainly vegans. And they are very keen that once you've been treated for orthorexia, they should not go back to becoming obsessive vegetarians or vegans. So you what know, is your opinion? You know, my opinion is this. So, oh. you know, there, there are people who say um, soya beans are bad for hypothyroidism, for example. Now, you're a doctor, I'm a doctor. Have you heard this before? Uh, yes, huh? Yes, you have. I'm a doctor, you're a doctor, and I've seen tons and tons of hypothyroidism cases. I have yet to see the one who got it because of eating too many soybeans. I I'm just saying, like I'm seeing, I'm like a general doctor, I'm seeing them left, right, and center. I haven't seen one who got it because of soy, or cabbage, or any such thing. So there are a lot of things that are told, but we have to check whether it's true or not. And um, I have yet to see some of those cases that I told them to become vegan and they went into this kind of problem. Sorry, I haven't seen that. So I would be relaxed on that. Would you had another question or was, have I answered both of yours? Oh, thank you for that. If anyone wants to get rid of something and you're really willing to do it, take a consultation and see what happens. Why not? 
because I worked as a homeopath. I got amazing results. I taught all over the world. But when I saw that something goes even better than that, I changed. And you're an eye doctor. You said you're an ophthalmologist, yes. right? I just want to tell you that, you know, there's this ophthalmologist in Mumbai who changed, and so many of his patients, because, you know, many of the cases in ophthalmology are because of diabetes as well. So many of his patients got better as well that he refers so many patients to us while he was talking about it. So we have a whole team of ophthalmologists who send patients to us because so many patients got better. I'm just saying. Uh, could I okay. just ask a question? Yes. So if I don't turn into a vegetarian, I can't discover this world where I'm going to be perfectly healthy. Is that what you're saying? If you don't turn into a vegetarian, and I'm not even talking about vegetarianism, so but okay, I can intervene. You can definitely not see what is the result of a plant-based diet if you don't try it. That's all. It's pretty simple. So that's what I'm saying, that if you're a non-vegetarian, and if you don't try and turn into, I wouldn't say vegan or whatever, everybody's entitled to their own way of eating, means you are missing out in this huge world of where all your lifestyle problems sure. can be changed. Sure. Now, I just want to know if that is what was... If you said. don't have any lifestyle problems, yeah. you shouldn't try it. That but means you're going good. if I'm eating meat and fish, then it may sort of like assume that automatically I will have lifestyle problems. What? So, what? Nandita ji, can I just intervene? Yes, yes, because yes. I am a hardcore non-vegetarian as well. Yes. And I understand her problem, but Gitanjali, just to reply to your thing, I think the way of thinking... What she's saying is, you know, we are non-vegetarians, but what happens tomorrow if I have diabetes or whatever, then I actually cut down on something to get, the, get back to normal, right? So exactly what she's saying, align yourself to nature a bit so that you don't have those problems, preempt them. So she's not saying that. No, she's saying if you're I, well, I, you I, don't have to. That, that I'm not exactly saying. I'm not saying that if you don't go all the way, you can get rid of every disease just by doing whatever you want. No. I'm saying that if you go, take one step forward, the next foot will come. That's all I'm saying. Now, if you want to get healthy, but you're not willing to follow nature's laws, I'm not promising you health. Now, you can go to a doctor. They may promise. You go to the one who promises health. Excuse me, I'm not going to be able to stand up, but I'd like to ask, uh, not a okay. question, I want to make I'm a statement. I'm coming here to listen I'm to here. you. I'm here. Ah, okay, okay. I'm, yes. I'm not able to stand up, but uh, my point is I have just lost my father at the age of 98. He was on a lot of medication, but uh, I bless the doctor who looked after him because he was a non-vegetarian and uh, we... Uh, you know, he, I looked after his nourishment, what he was meant to have, but he lived a good life. And uh, I think one of the most important things which you are missing today is having a positive mindset, which is so important actually for you not to get, uh, you know, okay. sick. So uh, this is something I just wanted to say that... I got to a point and I, I also said a positive mindset. However, it's like saying, hey... My grandfather was smoking all his life and he didn't die till 100. That doesn't make smoking healthy. Now, you're free to believe what you want and you can take all my words and put it in the trash. But you also have the choice to try it out and see if it's sure, good or I not. Sure, I agree with you there. Hmm? Of course, it's an option that we all have. But to condemn the other side is that's what I'm saying. Medication doesn't always harm. I, I wanted to just say, oh. say that. Okay, I'm not saying that medication always harms. Yes. I don't take my patients off medication right away. However, everybody should see the side effects of the medications they're taking before they take it. And I've seen a lot of people who are diabetic and who have been given sulfonylureas which eventually burn out their pancreas. Okay. I've seen a lot of people who are hypertensive and who have been given medicines that eventually cause kidney disease. Okay. And I don't want to say that medicine is the best thing in the world. 
I do want to say that the very best that we can do for our health is to live in a way that nature or God designed for us. That's all. Does a plant-based diet give us all the proteins that we need? Okay, thank you for that question. Does a plant-based diet give us all the proteins that we need? And obviously we think, oh my God, where will I get the proteins? So I want to ask you, how many of you know somebody with protein deficiency? Please put up your hand. Actually, protein deficiency has a name. It's kwashiorkor or protein calorie malnutrition and it usually occurs in starvation. And the reason it doesn't occur outside starvation is because if you have enough calories and naturally calories come with protein, that means there's not a single nutrient in the world, whole nutrient, which doesn't have protein. That means all the fruits, all the vegetables, all have protein because DNA and RNA are protein. You cannot escape protein when you eat a cell. But I do agree that some things have more protein than others. However, we have to think, where do horses get their protein from? Because we talk about horsepower or elephants or cows or other herbivores. The ones who run very fast, the deers, where do they get their protein from? And uh, whatever I'm saying, you know, I've been doing it for the last 35 years. So I'm not pulling a fast one or just bud budding here. But uh, I've been working with patients for the last 20 years with this, you know. And I didn't start working with patients till I fully understood. But um, I know that protein deficiency is extremely rare. It occurs in some severe kidney cases and other things, but in general, it's extremely rare because all of us are well fed. Now, just when I ask you, what is protein good for? Uh, let me ask you that question. What is protein good for? Why do we need protein? Okay, so that was a trick question. Everyone will say to grow muscles. And that's because we have been we have been told this by the bodybuilders or the trainers or whatever. Protein is a food for growth and repair. You know, human milk has one third the protein as cow's milk. Why? Because the rate of growth of a human being is less than that of a cow. When we consume cow's milk, we automatically have excess protein. Now, just to take the argument a little further, our body is alkaline. And doctors, please correct me if I'm wrong. Our body is alkaline. If we take something which is acid in high doses, then it has to be neutralized, and it's neutralized by taking calcium out of the bones. That's why so many people who are on dairy get osteoporosis. So it's not as easy, but if you follow nature's laws, it's harder to get sick. Now, that's my experience. All I can share is my experience. Doctor, I'll make it quick. Uh, so I know a lot of thyroid cases have been probably reversed with food. Yes. Uh, but, but what about uh, autoimmune thyroid disorders where your own body's sort of producing right. antibodies? So autoimmune thyroid is just one of the hundreds of autoimmune diseases that we're seeing these days. Um, autoimmune diseases, hypothyroidism, multiple sclerosis, ankylosing, spondylitis, type 1 diabetes, it goes on and on and on. And when we have an autoimmune disease, we have a foreign protein in our body which stimulates an immune response. That antibody is destroying our own cells. Now, it will get better, but it takes time. Like I have to say, I had an autoimmune disease. And I have cases who have had autoimmune disease. They feel better fast. But to get rid of an autoimmune disease, you have to wait for those antibodies to die in your body. Thank okay, you. I've got to go. But here's what I do want to end with a few words. That if you want to learn more, you can go to our website, right? 
And we put all our information up on the website, lots of recipes and everything, so you can go to our website. We also have online consultations, and we also have retreats where you can see everything happen on the spot, okay? So all of these, and then these books that are available outside, besides the reversing diabetes book, they are also available free on our website as a PDF. So hard copy here, but you can also get it as a PDF on our website. And you can try it, and please do let me know. Write to me anytime if you try it, and let me know how you do. Okay? Thank you very much.